Hello, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 5 of the Virtual Coffee Podcast. I'm Becca, and this is a podcast that features members of the Virtual Coffee community. Virtual Coffee is an intimate group of developers at all stages of their coding journey, and they're here on this podcast sharing their stories and what they've learned. And we're here to share it with you. Here with me today is my co-host, Dan. Hey, Becca. Today, we're talking with Roger Gentry. Roger has spent a lot of his career managing security and compliance for clients across the United States. In this episode, you'll hear from Roger about perseverance, his drive to solve problems, and his process for finding solutions. He shares some tips for working through frustrations and how to ask for help. We start every episode of the podcast like we start every virtual coffee. We introduce ourselves with our name, where we're from, what we do, and a random check-in question. We hope you enjoy this episode. Today's random check-in question is, if you could be an article of clothing, what would it be? My name is Becca. I am a technical community builder from a small town in Ohio. And if I could be any article of clothing, it'd probably be a sweatshirt, like a hoodie, um, because I have a collection of them <laughs> since the pandemic started. I just keep buying them. I can't stop. They're very comfortable and I like them. So I'll go with hoodie. Yeah, hoodies are good. Um, hi, I'm Dan. I am a web developer from Cleveland, Ohio. And yeah, if I could mm, be an article of clothing, I, I mean, hoodie was like up there. I think, um, I think I'm going to go with like a, a rain shell. So like a rain, yeah, raincoat. So I say shell because it's like, that's what, <laughs> that's what you call it when it's camping, right? So shell Nobody is something that can go. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People who, <laughs> people who know, who know. And, and if you don't know, then that's fine too. But uh, it's like, it's called a shell because you can put it on top of, you know, if you have a hoodie or whatever, you can still wear, it, you know, your raincoat. It keeps you protected, but yeah, you can wear it in the summer and stuff too. But raincoat. It um, goes over your raincoat? No, no, no. It's a raincoat, but like, not like a fancy raincoat that looks nice. It's like a raincoat that is, you know, a utility. You call it a shell because you can put it over, you know, you can like I bring the same raincoat camping in the summer and the winter or whatever, you know? So in the winter, I just put it over top of all my layers in the summer, put it over top of my t-shirt or whatever. That's why you call it a shell. I would like it to look like a turtle shell. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you can have the turtle shell rain, rain shell. <laughs> That'd be fine too. Hey everyone, my name's Roger and I'm a full stack uh, developer in sunny Southern California. And if I was an article of clothing, I'd have to be a zip up hoodie, specifically a zip up hoodie because everything else just sort of, uh, you get caught in the, in the web of the, the sweater, the zip up, you can just go quickly from hot to cold. And you know, I love that. Yeah. I, I like the zip up hoodie too. It just depends on my mood, but also like Sometimes it's hot and sometimes it's cold and it's much easier to remove one that has a zipper. Yeah. I mean, zip up hoodies are clearly better than pullovers. I mean, there's, there's, there's no contest. Not all the time. I mean, zippers are cold too. So if it's cold outside and they touch your skin, then it's cold. Roger, thanks for being here. We're very glad to have you on the podcast. And when we start the podcast, everyone, we like to get people's origin stories. So how, what brought you to where you are today? in life you know it's kind of funny i i kind of remember the first time that i saw somebody building a website and it was some friends of mine in the school library and uh they just were having fun and i wanted to do that as well so i kind of acquired a free computer and uh just set that up in my room like you know this is I can't even remember the year, early 2000s. So, you know, it wasn't that uh, advanced to have a laptop quite yet for me. And once I kind of figured out how I could build a website with HTML and CSS and Notepad uh, on the Windows, I kind of was hooked. And it just sort of became uh, almost like a hobby that just kept me going all the time. And... I took that skill set and immediately did the thing that I've done kind of forever now is turned it into a way to make money, which uh, I did by going to just the 
businesses that were in my town and finding the one that just had a terrible website and convincing them that they needed a new one and I could be the person to build it. Um, kind of as I went along in school and eventually high school, I had an opportunity to take kind of a, a multimedia course, which taught me a lot of like Photoshop, uh, Illustrator, just a lot of uh, photo editing and video editing skills that I kind of combined into this you know, love of code with the web design uh, side of things. And, you know, that kind of propelled me uh, forward. And I've always had a knack for fixing things. So I kind of landed in this uh, weird place of uh, fixing a lot more things than I was building. But then using the skill set of being, you know, a developer at heart to build uh, solutions to solve problems in ways that people weren't thinking about. And that excited me more and more. And, you know, I'm kind of a, a person of necessity. If I if I see something that I, I really need, I'll figure out a way to get it. And I wanted to build a SaaS product for fun uh, and to kind of manage to make that possible with a, a company I was working at. And we we had a lot of fun putting it together, but then I kind of found I had a lot more fun building kind of the prototype and understanding the code and coming up with the methodologies and how we were going to do things. And looking back, I, I kind of have always been a, like a web developer, but it was at that point where I was putting together this weird little cloud service that I really saw a need to become an everything developer because you know there was so much more that was missing from what I wanted to put together. And that led me just to kind of absorb into building iOS and Android applications and then a web backend and, you know, combining everything together and finding the glue that works the best, which surprisingly, there's no really good fit all solution, despite any of the marketing that you'll see on anybody's products and getting everything together and finally seeing like an API that I wrote and connect to the apps that it, I help build with the website that I put together for a customer that I sold an idea to. Like that was the moment that I really kind of found like the groove that I liked to exist in. And it it's always propelled me to have ideas and projects that I like working on. But, you know, going back, I still think of the dorky kid that was sitting in his room reading the uh, HTML and CSS for dummies book that he bought at the thrift store for 50 cents. And, you know, that's propelled me into a lifelong career of not only learning, but also figuring things out and solving problems in just a different way. Because, you know, I've come from a, a place where it, I've been building out a necessity. And if you tell me that there's a problem, I'll figure out a way to fix it. The way to fix it might not be the best way, but it's working. I love that. I, I love that you're, and and like I th I think uh, maybe not where you ended up in your career path, but the beginnings of your career started off this very similar to mine, right? Uh, I think I had that exact same for dummies book that I bought at the thrift store as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, like the 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 cool thing that for me is is that like how how you sort of organically followed right what you what you found interesting, what you saw, you know neat like you saw there was a need for different pieces to different puzzles right and um the idea that you don't have to stay in one lane or or or, or one specialty or anything like that right i mean full stack developer is a pretty common phrase these days i think but um i think that i think that my favorite part about that the full stack idea is is the idea that like it you have the power, like any person has the power to kind of go and, and chase down, you know, something that they want to, that they find interesting and want to, and want to build or want to fix or want to solve. I think that's really cool. Something that would happen when I was working as a technician is, you know, I'd come in and I'd fix a, a problem that for the user was really, really difficult. And I made it seem impossibly easy. And a lot of them would say, wow, you're a wizard. You fix it like magic. And when you sit in front of, you know, a, a, a terminal for the first time so to speak and you run that code and it does the thing that you told it to like it feels like magic it feels like you you cast a spell and something cool happened and you know i feel like that that magic is captivating for for a lot of people and like once you once you see it once you realize that you can cast that spell and make that magic happen like 
it's almost an addiction. Like you're like, oh, what other things can I do? It's like, oh yeah, this doorbell is no longer supported. Let's see if we can, you know, hack it and make it something, something useful again. Like it's just, you find solutions to problems that, you know, you didn't even know were problems because now you know the magic behind how it all works. Yeah, I love how you talk so much about the the magic and the problem solving. And I think that's one of the things that interests so many people about being in tech. And it's simultaneously one of the most frustrating things about being in tech, right? Like it can get hard. You're stuck on those problems and it um, sometimes it causes feelings of self-doubt. Like, oh, what kind of programmer am I? I can't figure this out. So how do you approach problem solving and and maybe avoid those feelings? Or do you have tips on how to avoid those feelings? You know, so much of what I've been able to figure out has been a, let me just change this line of code, refresh and see if it fixes the problem. And, you know, I come from a background of fixing a lot of weird problems that I never had uh, a say in creating. And so a lot of the times it was like, okay, this was doing a thing correctly before, and this is how we got to there. Now, when I try to do these steps, this is what happens. Well, now I know how to replicate the problem and I got to just work backwards from there and try to figure out why it's failing in that step. And okay, well, now we know it's this problem. Let's search around and see if we can figure out if there's a solution for this somewhere that we can use or if we just keep having to dig further down. So it's kind of more of a beat it with a hammer until it shows you like something that's useful. And then you take that little spec and it's like, okay, let's analyze this and go down a rabbit hole and solve that problem and then move on to the next era. And eventually you'll find kind of the answer. And then once you have like that experiences to that one problem, you, you know that that networking piece of, of equipment in the closet was actually the faulty, you know, problem, the whole thing. And it was a bad ethernet cable that somebody, you know, broke in the door that caused everybody's issues for the day and now in the future when you're sitting there looking at that similar you know problem you know your mind's thinking about these things as well whereas before it may have taken you hours to get there well now i know i can overcome that because i had to do it in a time of crisis and i can if i can overcome that this little error that i'm dealing with i'll figure out eventually and it's the same thing with programming like i was dealing with like just uh some data formats that I wasn't familiar with and I wanted to just sort of see if I could figure it out. It took a little while, but eventually, you know, I put enough pieces to the puzzle together and I got the answer I needed. And like, it, it was one of those moments where it's like, I overcame something that was only existed because the way that I formatted the first time wasn't necessarily the correct way to parse that data. But then once I figured out the right way, it like, it worked. And then I'm sitting there being like, ha, huh, now it works. And instantly i was trying to find the next problem to solve yeah that um dopamine rush from actually solving the thing right and, it, and it's like greater i feel like for me at least most of the time anyway it's it's greater the harder it is you know the, the deeper down the rabbit hole you go right there's sometimes where i get all the way down and i figure it out but it's taken me so long <laughs> That, that I'm just like, I, I just hate this. Like, finally, this bug is squashed, you know? But I think lots of times I, I get that. I get that same, um, that same like spike of uh, just feels good. I'm like, okay, let's find out what's next, you know? I think that's so cool. I've had times where I, I spent uh, a lot of the night in a networking closet trying to solve some weird networking problem and trying to get something that was on the network that was working before I got there wasn't working now to back to that working state and it's hot and it's terrible and I'm hungry. <laughs> and so anytime that I'm sitting in front of my computer working on a hard coding problem, I think back, I think back to myself in the networking closet and remember I'm not there and I can eat something and I can step away and it is fine because I will figure it out. And it's, it's kind of like the sense of encouragement that I tell myself when I'm dealing with the hard problem, just knowing that eventually it will be solved one way or another. And there's only so much I can worry about with it right now. And eventually you just have to say enough's enough, walk away and come back to it later. And then you're like, Oh yeah, you know what? I don't know why this is so hard earlier. I was just grumpy. I think that's great advice. And I, I like, I want to reiterate that because that's one of the hardest things to remember. And it's so easy to get stuck in that. Like it's, it's so easy. It's hard. It's like when you're down in some hole, you know, trying to figure something out and nothing makes sense. It's hard to step away. It's at least for me, it's hard. I, I have a hard time stepping away. And, but you're right, Roger, like every time that I do, it's helpful. Like it's always helpful. And I'm always like, why didn't I just 
do this an hour ago? <laughs> like, why didn't I stick, go walk around the building or go get it, you know, across the street, get a cup of coffee or something like to, the, it, every time, you know, like not every time, but it, it happens to me so often, you know, and it's like, I don't know, almost physically hard to, to get myself to step away. I'm like, I know I can get this if I just. I always get annoyed when people are like, just step, you yeah, just need right. to go for a walk. I'm like, you just don't need to tell me what to do, right? And then like an hour and a half later, I have to do it. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. Like, yes, I, now I, I get it. <laughs> I think part of that is, uh, you know, that there's like that dopamine rush when you're going to solve the problem. And so you're like, if I just do this a little bit longer, it will be solved and I'm going to feel good about it. And so you're, you're, you're so in the middle of like that frustrating piece where you just like, you know, the payoff is going to be so much better, the more frustrated at the problem that you're going to, you are that you just want to finish it. And stepping away is almost like a sign of defeat into yourself. No one else cares, but you, but you, but even so like that, that step away is what you need. And yet doing it is so frustratingly difficult. Yeah, there, I was working on this problem last week and I knew that I was close, right? Like I could feel it. There was something wrong and I, I just needed to spend more time going over line by line, which I had already done. I had already done with other people too. And then finally I, uh, well, then I, I go into this mode of, all right, I know that one of these things is wrong. And then I just start like throwing code at it chaotically that's not what you should do <laughs> because somewhere in there i had the right piece but then i messed up the other piece that connected it and so then it still didn't work and then i i was uh, debugging it with a coworker, and they said oh yeah it's this thing this is what i expected it was you know you you forgot to i was like i did have that i had it at one point i just deleted it okay and and so instead i had this mess of a, a code base that that's not what you want so like taking i think that taking that advice of walking away thinking through the problem rather than just like throwing all of the things at it is uh, a skill i need to learn maybe <laughs> The uh, other approach that I like to the mingled code base is the burn it all to the ground, take what we know is good, and let's just start over for a little bit because we learned a lot in throwing all of the spaghetti against the wall, but yet nothing really stuck. But we've learned some stuff in the process, so we're going to take what the good bits that we know go back to where we know the data is good and try to do what, say it, what we want. And probably starting over with a fresh slate is going to give us the answers we need because we were not good when we were writing that other code. We were frustrated. Yeah. And I think that's great advice. And it helps sort of isolate, you know, you can still add things a bit at a time, you know, so starting from that fresh, the fresh, like the fresh slate, you know, uh, add things step by step, you know, and, and you, you're very like, you know how you want it to work. So it, maybe the, the, the route will be a little bit more straightforward this way, right? Because you have like a plan in your head, um, but it'll help you sort of isolate the problem too. Um, that's good advice. The spaghetti on the wall method, right? <laughs> My favorite method. Um, so one of the things that we talk a lot about at Virtual Coffee is asking questions. And I think that this kind of goes along with the conversation about, you know, how do you ask questions? How do you ask for help? Like, what is the right approach to doing that? And it can be in your code base. It could be when you're interviewing for a job. But what do you think is a good approach to asking questions or asking for support or help or finding it? Uh, so it kind of kind of depends on the problem, right? If you're talking about, you know, you're sitting in an interview and you want to know if they do X, Y, or Z, right? You just ask. And like, it seems scary at first, but every company that I've been in the first interview with, and I've been like, so what kind of like hardware stack are we dealing with? They are always like, wait, why do you care? Like you're interviewing for this role. And it's like, well, no, I generally want to make sure it's something that I'm going to be interested in dealing with before. Like I get excited and we waste everybody's time and then I get to the job and it's not exciting. Like, and each time that I've asked like weird difficult questions or just something that I was just curious about. It, it's always netted a good result in the interview. Like uh, I remember in one where I asked the uh, founder of the company where he sees himself in the organization in five years. And 
that was a that was a fun question to see the laughs on all of the other managers where they're just like <laughs> but the answer that he gave me was more about the vision of the company and where they wanted to take it which was really exciting and so you you kind of take that same approach when you're dealing with code right if you have a problem you look at your error message and i just start by taking the error message copying and pasting it to the search engine and then say stack overflow give me the great answers to my problem and combining that with whatever language you're writing it in and what you're trying to do typically nets somebody else on the internet who has the same problem and there's probably an xkcd that's relevant to that exact topic because I've <laughs> linked to it many times. And it's just, it's kind of that, like, you know, it doesn't matter what the problem you're dealing with, There, there's an answer out there somewhere. Somebody knows that answer to the problem you're dealing with, and it's just, how do we get there? And sometimes the answer is you need to call the vendor or email the person that wrote it. And it seems terrifying the first dozen times that you email somebody that wrote some piece of code. But it's something that I've learned about developers and people that work in technology is given an opportunity to talk about something nerdy we're going to waste as much time as we possibly can because it's so rare that we get somebody who's like excited about the same thing that we're doing and then it's just like okay yeah that took so much effort to write that email but now like i know this guy and we're gonna totally meet for drinks when he's at this conference because like that's the connection we made and it's just about asking the questions and just finding the right person and everybody's got an email address on their code or you can message them in Twitter, which is still a weird experience just to be able to message some random company and being like, Hey, I have this thing. Would you be interested? And then next thing you know, you're on a meeting to, you know, meet the person that posted that tweet. And that's kind of the whole power that we have today where we didn't have, I feel like when I got started in technology, there was, there was no Facebook. There was no MySpace. It seems like a weird time because I'm not that old. But in the in the age of tech, you know, you it moves at such a rapid pace that you are you get dated very quickly if you're not paying attention. And at that time period, like finding information was a lot harder. But now it's just it just depends on how persistent you are and how bad you want that thing or in that answer. If you really, really want the answer to the question, you'll find it. It just might take some time. Sorry, I was, I was, yeah. I was thinking. I was deep in thought. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was just reminiscing back when there was no Stack Overflow. <laughs> My kids like to refer to that as the olden days. We watched the the Amazing Spider-Man, the one with Andrew Garfield this weekend. And they're like, oh, we didn't know that you had movies with this good CGI back in the olden days. I was like, this movie is not even no. that old. <laughs> kids. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. And so I think that making those connections is so important. And then like asking, asking informed questions too, right? Because when you're DMing someone or emailing someone, you, you let them know what you've been working on or how you've been approaching that thing. Or, you know, I, one of the things that I like about um, our virtual coffee repository is we have issue templates, we have PR templates, or is that what they're called? Templates? Forms, Temp issue forms. Blitz. Oh, <laughs> templates. Am I saying it wrong? Well, that's not, I wasn't asking you to correct that, how I, I say think, it. I was I just wondering wrong, if they're called templates. Right, wrong situation. But I think that's more of a local dialect situation. <laughs> it's not what I was asking. <laughs> forms, uh, issue, issue form forms. Yeah, forms. Issue forms. The that's point is... <laughs> no, I don't know. They started as templates and other forms. That's it. Yeah. Well, one of them is a form, right? Right, right. No, that's what I mean. That, the issue ones, yeah. This they used to be. We used to have issue templates, and now we converted them to issue forms. And now we just has issues everywhere. No, there's just issues. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of issues. <laughs> um, but it breaks. It kind of like breaks down how to ask questions, and because we work with so many developers at all stages of the journey. It, it's nice to kind of create a methodical process for question asking um, or helping people to go through this process of this is what I see. This is what I've done. This is what I want to see done, you know, and providing some evidence for that, because it, sometimes you have a random question and 
it feels exhausting or overwhelming to try and answer a question if there's no context there, right? If you already have a full slate of work on your desk and somebody asks you, hey, have you, I don't, I don't know. I can't think of a good example right now, but like, did I use this thing right? Okay, well, walk me through your code, right? And I think that that's one of those things that kind of, it's a skill that takes time to develop that question asking ability. And uh, another reason why I love the the co-working room too, because you have the time to have those conversations. And Roger, I know that you've spent some time in the co-working room as well. Yeah, it's, I, I always love just kind of hanging out in there because you never know what kind of conversations you're going to have. And it definitely feels like you're at work and these are your coworkers because, you know, there's, there's a sense of, of community to it. But at the same time, you know, like the conversations aren't going to take a, a weird turn. They're going to typically stay around a, a centralized set of topics. And it, it's comforting to be able to be just around other people who are programmers and nerds and just generally interested in pretty much the same things you are. And just being like, hey, I'm working on this like weird code, like, is there anybody that wants to jump in and like give me some advice on what I'm doing wrong or how I can make it better? And, you know, it's kind of exciting just to see the problem solving that other people go through and sometimes just the patience that some people have mentoring people. It, it's really amazing and, and kind of, you know, a lead by example in some places where you see these things happen and you're just like, wow, I want to I want to improve how I instruct people based off of like what I just kind of saw. And it's just kind of a cool place just to meet people from kind of all around the world who just are hanging out just wanting to just chill for a few minutes and just talk about whatever whatever you're talking about jump into the conversation and jump out it's it's really like uh been a great sense of community since uh you know honestly i found virtual coffee when the pandemic kind of was going on and like i dived into there and that became kind of uh a lot of the close friendships that I had because it was just always open and you meet a lot of really cool, interesting people. And actually my current, my current job, um, I was actually interviewed uh, originally in the co-working room, which led me to being interviewed by the company and accepting the role with there. So I always think that's a, that's a fun little story with the virtual coffee because, you know, there's so many of these people that join looking for a job and, are hoping to find something but sometimes you end up finding something in the same room that you're just hanging out with and for fun sharing just some project that you had an idea about or passionate about so i love that that's such a fun story um okay so you i uh we're talking about problem solving and and um navigating through like enjoying that part that aspect of coding so what is the um, maybe strangest or most complicated problem you've had to navigate? So I think this goes back to the days when I was working in a support role at a managed service provider, which means we ran their whole help desk. And this is one of my favorite stories to tell because it's just so weird. So the customer I was supporting is a company that does uh that paints boats. When I'm talking about boats, I'm talking about big ships that are, you know, the, the, the ships that they have at Disneyland type size. And they have an oven that is the size of a literal warehouse where they put these boats in to have the paint cure. And all of this data from all of these temperature sensors from all around that warehouse get fed into one computer. And what happened is that aging desktop, which was running probably Windows 98 or something similar, and some version of Excel, it died. And suddenly their whole business wasn't able to operate because the computer that ran the sensors that gave them the data to certify all of their work wasn't working. And I remember trying everything that I could to build a virtual machine that had that operating system to run this thing and just constant problems. And eventually I solved that problem by getting it stood up with a new version of Windows and everything working inside it. And in a version of Excel that I found on an abandonware website that was like a release candidate that they didn't put any product activations in. 
And it was the least to the cure version of Excel that I could find to run the macro that this business relied on to capture this data from the sensor. It was it was a lot. We had adapters to serial cables pulling in this data into a macro in inside of Excel. And eventually this all got ran ran into a Windows 10 box eventually and virtualized and ran indefinitely. But it was just the the amount of sheer what is going on and how are we going to fix this like to get over the finish line was just <laughs> astronomical. And like I look back and I think to myself like, you know, if I could fix a boat up and none of these other problems seem that hard, they'll figure it out. Like it's the same thing about being in a network closet. Like yeah, that's that you just remember like all of these problems have solutions. You're going to get there eventually. It's just a matter of <laughs> what ridiculous thing you're going to need to get it across the finish line in the moment. And I, I feel like when programming, it's a lot of more, a lot more critical thinking. And sometimes you just need more information. And just like, if you're dealing with a problem with databases, you can't really figure out what the heck you're doing. Stop and like, go look at some completed databases. And then you're like, Oh, that's what I was doing wrong. And suddenly things click into place. And, you know, I just remember so many times as a technician where there wasn't documentation or somebody to ask. It was figure it out to the best that you can because their vendor that built this uh, system went out of business before you were born. Um, <laughs> and that's and that's a fun that's a fun place to exist. But the thing that I've learned the most about programming and programming languages specifically is once you learn the basics, they all start to kind of merge together. And if you know how an if loop and a while loop works, well, you can pretty much program like 90% of the crap you need to get the job done. Uh, and, and that's really what it takes, like a few a few if statements and you've got most of the programs that are running some of the largest systems are just simple things. And when you can look at a coding language that's written in something that some random developer came up with, and you're just able to read through it and understand it because not because you understand the programming language, but because you understand that a loop's going to keep going back through these things and eventually it's going to do this. So now I'm looking for this problem. You can pretty much go down any rabbit hole and find what you're looking for just as long as you're just willing to keep looking. It's the same thing with the boat oven. I just kept looking and I found eventually found a way to fix it. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I, and I think that, and I feel like I've said this probably before, but that's like one of the biggest things that separates somebody that has more experience from somebody who is more starting out is not necessarily the knowledge accrued, but more the sort of confidence that you can do the thing like that, that like you can probably solve pretty much anything given, you know, enough time, I suppose. But, like, you know, like, like you said, like that, if you, if you, have less experience you just have less like practice uh reading code and being used to loops and and if statements and stuff um then jumping trying to read some other code in a different language that you're not used to is going to seem probably a lot more daunting you know but having done it for a long time it's it, it's just like that it's that practice you know the practice of just like i mean it's just like you said you know like i have solved this huge bug in the in the past so i just kind of know that any other bug that comes up I'm going to be fine. <laughs> right. Or, or on the, on the other side of it is like, I know I've taken down production once. Oh, so God. if I do it again, I, I know what to expect. <laughs> it's sort of like I've been chewed out. <laughs> I'll just get chewed out again. It doesn't yeah. feel like terrifying experiences to me. <laughs> uh, have, have you done it live on a Twitch stream though? <laughs> There's still time. There's still time. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that was not my best moment, but uh, I got through it, right? <laughs> you did. You. I think I would just, I, I want to crawl under the bed and yeah. stay there. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is a, a good point to mention how important backups and version control are. <laughs> and don't be afraid to commit that code, even if you're not quite ready for it. Just having something in there that you can go back and look at and be like, that's what I did four and a half hours ago. It's yes. so helpful. It's so helpful. Yes. Yeah. Even like that project that I was just talking about, I was talking through it with Kirk one day. Um, he was like, well, you know, have you committed recently? And I was like, I don't have any commits. 
It was just like, you know, I, it wasn't going to be a big project. I thought that I could do it really quickly and get it done. And then it was like, oh, yeah. this was a mistake. Yeah, that would have been, that for sure would have been useful. Yeah, no, that's very good advice too. It, it's like at the times that I've done it, it, it's been, it's been super helpful and it helps with that. Um, and it gives you more confidence with that, um, the approach of just kind of trying stuff out, right? Throwing stuff at the problem because you know that it, I mean, it's easy. It's easy to go back, right? It's easy to throw things out. It's easy to go back and look at your history. Um, and you can always like, if you're embarrassed by the, <laughs> the commits or the commit, like you can always just kind of quash them right into like, once you finally solve it into one commit, you know? Uh, but I, I mean, I'll have commits that are just like, well, let's try this, try this, try this. That didn't work. Try this, try this, you know? <laughs> and that's like, that's not what you want to push up uh, ultimately, but it's perfectly fine when you're in your, when you're like, you know, trying to work your way through, through a problem. Uh, at least, at least I think it is, I don't know. <laughs> Other people might disagree with me, but. I'm definitely afraid to commit until like the code is p perfect, just because I feel like so many people are going to be judging me based off of what they're saying. Um, but at the same time, that causes me to forget to commit my changes. And I have a habit of doing that frequently, which the best part about being a developer is you can always automate solutions to your problems. Uh, one of mine has been uh, every 15 minutes, take a git commit and just go ahead and just save that with a timestamp. And I've written that as a bash uh, script because that was the easiest, lowest hanging fruit that I could do. And it works marvelously. And I've used that for a number of other projects where I wrote a whole, uh, a whole set of scripts that took and used Vim as a note-taking application with an autosave and sync functionality powered by Git and Bash that just was a few hours of just throwing things together because I was annoyed that I forgot to save something important into the thing that I was using as a notepad. So I'm like, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> and it, you know, you solve a problem and you just use the tools that were available. And yeah. Do you have a blog post or a tutorial on the things that you've done? Because that would be super cool to read. I definitely should write this one up because I think I had intended to, but then I, again, got distracted and forgot to complete it, which I, I, I could say that a lot about a lot of the domains that I purchased is about being like, hey, this is an idea. Ooh, the domain's available. Oh, I should build this. And then I get the renewal notice a year later. <laughs> You have right. a domain with an emoji in it, right? So I am actually the proud owner of the email emoji.fm, and I have been trying to figure out the best way to create an emoji-based social networking email platform around that that is just purely nothing but emojis. But uh, amazingly enough, it is uh, surprisingly difficult to get emails delivered that contain emojis. So I have been trying to overcome a lot of um, fun technical problems getting that service uh, spun up. But uh, yeah, that's that's a lot of uh, entertainment in itself is just, uh, hey, go check out this uh, emoji email and or domain. And you're just like, I didn't even know emojis could be domains. And it, it causes a lot of things that, you shouldn't be buying to enter your uh, credit card bill. <laughs> I love that. I always love hearing stories. You tell stories about the things that you're doing because like one, they're super entertaining, but then also you come out with stuff like that. Like, yeah, I've bought an emoji domain that never would have crossed my mind to even try doing. I don't just have one. I have a, a specific one that I've been putting together for a authentication service that is themed about a wizard. And it, the link is literally the link emoji with the magic wand because they're magic links. And so the whole idea is making a, a, a single sign on magic link service that uses emojis as the links just because like it, in the right audience, it's it's really entertaining. But it's also, you know, a lot harder to, to forge those because, you know, how many people are going to be using emojis in their thing? Well, That's once cool. you, you get uh, investors, everybody's going to be using it. It's going to be the next big thing. It, will, it won't be something of the olden days. It'll be of the new end days. <laughs> well, the thing that I love about emojis is especially like in virtual coffee is a good example. We have an international community of developers that come together, but the thing that is most universal is the wave emoji. Like everybody knows what that means. Everybody can react and like 
emojis in, in themselves almost a universal language. doesn't matter which one you speak or read, the emojis will pretty much mean the same thing. Okay, so so you have, I was going to ask, one of my questions was like, what is the the coolest problem that you want to solve? And you're, you're talking about some cool things. So I don't know if you've already mentioned it or if you've got another big idea you want to share. I think I think the one that when I talk about the the eyes light up behind everybody being like what I didn't even know that that was like something that people were thinking about and it's kind of one of the things that I found like the my first love of communities and it, it surrounds uh, zombies actually which is kind of like what makes everybody laugh and I want and I am building a whole platform that does essentially a distributed network of servers that cache basically a copy of like the Internet Archive, the public domain knowledge and stores them in kind of a way that makes it accessible. And like the idea behind it is this uh, this whole nonprofit in self-sufficiency, rebuilding and being resourceful with just what you have. And part of it comes from my desire just to want to host what I call zombie con and where you've got a junk pile of computers and a challenge and you throw a bunch of nerds that say, okay, rebuild the internet and here's what you get to use for it. Because I think when you're building out a necessity, the solutions that you come to problems become so much different than when you have the luxury of both time and resources. And I feel like something special will come out of that, that I don't even realize but I just uh, every time that I kind of talk about that particular side of things, like it gets people excited because, you know, there's a sense in all of us that I feel like you want that dopamine effect of being like, I did it, whether it's solving a problem in your code, it's fixing a server, or if it's like just simple and simple as patching that drywall and looking back, be like, you can't even tell. Like, <laughs> it's that sense of pride and accomplishment that you get out of like the work that you do that drives all of us. And the thing that I've really wanted to build is the just the way that we can share that and like make these things being like this is how you patch a drywall and open sourcing those and making them available as many people that are interested in it and just trying to figure out ways to again make it accessible and last through the apocalypse because I feel like that's the hardest challenge you could ever possibly think about and thinking about ways to solve that and just make your I don't know it just keeps me up at night. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like our most valuable resource is our knowledge. And if we have to start over, losing our knowledge base as a humanity would be the most detrimental thing. And so the more that we work to figure out a way to not only maintain that, but also use that data. And, and part of what drives the fun on this is like you can download the entirety of Stack Overflow as a SQL database to your computer. And now you have the entirety of all of the question and answers that you have needed to fix your programming at your fingertips. It's only up to you to figure out how to query that data to find the answers you need. And I think like doing that offline where you don't have connection to the internet, like makes you more resourceful and like you, you solve the problems in a different way. And I feel like just, I feel so excited when I do it on my own. So I just, like trying to build the platforms and giving the people the encouragement and like the support to know that like all of this stuff's possible here, here's a way to get started. That's awesome. Like I said, it causes, causes everybody to just go down that rabbit hole and you start thinking about these things and you're just like, man, I don't even know how to store, you know, flour for longer than a couple of days. Like how am I going to store for years? And there are different problems you have to try to solve. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like that idea about things get done differently if it's out of necessity. There's a very different approach in a lot of, I don't know, I don't know if I want to say like innovation that comes out of it, but you know, when you have to do something, you're going to think about it in a different way and, and you are going to change things to make sure that it gets accomplished. At that I feel in my mind I'm building like a scientific trial on what that looks like you know like let's make these people do it out of necessity and then these people can brainstorm how does that turn out I yeah but I mean I think that's a it's a really interesting point and it's one of the like 
sort of through lines of the way you've been talking, you know, especially about your career and you know the choice you made, right? Is is that is that doing by necessity, and it's a much different um, learning path than school, like a normal, like a sort of traditional school or even a boot camp, right? Where you're learning because somebody told you to learn this thing, right? Uh, so maybe somebody that comes out of if there was some, I don't know if there is these days or not a front end development, like actual degree, these, uh, who knows, but you know, like uh, uh, somebody who graduates school with that sort of thing will have a sort of a, maybe a different knowledge set than somebody who is working for four years, right. In, in that field. And there's going to be things that they do know that the other person doesn't and vice versa, you know, um, but that necessity, uh, driving force is, is, a. Uh, I don't know. It's an important, and interesting, it's an interesting thing. You me. know, absolutely. And and I started I started my whole career before I feel like boot camps were a thing. I I tried going to school to learn IT, but by that point, I understood more than they were trying to teach me, and I I couldn't. It was it was, it was a difficult time. And when I realized that I can just sort of get the job without needing anything more than being able to do it, like. That just caused me just to, oh, I'm going to learn this. Okay, yeah, I can do that. And it just, for me, it's self-propelled because I always had the tools to figure it out because that's how I started. I started, you know, not having the luxury of being able to search the internet for something because I didn't have the internet to search. I had HTML and CSS for dummies. I had to find it in that book and you use that resource. And so going from that to to now, like, and having to be able to figure things out at a necessity because there are people that couldn't work because their technology wasn't working and you're responsible to fix it to being like, okay, now we have these massive sets of problems. How can we resolve all of them with automation or how can we solve an unknown problem or build new problems with code? And that's, that's kind of exciting because like for me, I never learned the fundamentals like you would in school. And I, there's great benefit to going through because like different people learn different ways. And I feel like I had an understanding from what I learned on how all the, how all the programming language kind of overlapped. But when you're in school or you go through boot camp, you learn those same things. You get that same sense of encouragement that, you know, I had to go through and overcome kind of in the life in the life field where there were real consequences if things didn't work out. But going through a traditional or going through a school or a boot camp, you know, you get kind of battle tested early on because they're shifting you through all of these ideas and concepts. And you learn fundamentally how all these things work, which gives you enough confidence to sort of jumpstart where you need to be because you go from having no idea how any of this technology works to being like, I know how magic works and I will figure out how to cast a spell dagmatic. And and that in itself is power. It is power. It's awesome. It's such a good feeling. It, well, it doesn't matter how you how you learn like that that feeling of of knowing how to do the thing, knowing how to cast the magic spell. I I, I love it. It's great. Well, Roger, uh, we're just about out of time, so I want to thank you for being here. Is there any last bits of advice or things you want our listeners to hear? Ooh, I never. I didn't think about this. I should have come prepared. <laughs> I, I just think like if you're looking at something and you feel out of place or you feel like you can't do it or you're not good enough or what have you, like don't feel discouraged because at some point everybody has been that point and has looked through and has gotten over it. And it's just a matter of you getting to it. You just have to do it. And then once you've done it, it's easy. And I try to avoid saying things are easy because it wasn't easy for me when I started, but once I did it, it became easy. And so just remembering like getting over that first hurdle and having the confidence of doing the thing, doesn't matter what that thing is. Eventually you're going to do it. Doesn't matter how long you wait to do it, but you'll get over that hurdle and it's going to get easier from there because once you do it, you figured it out. You can't unfigure it out. It only goes one direction. It's a one way street. Once you start walking it, that's it. You're just going to keep figuring things out. And when you start, when you start out, I feel like everything is overwhelming and, you know, there's just a lot of information coming in. And when you first sit down and you're following all of these, you know, tutorials, like, Hey, it works. But then when you try to do it on your own, it doesn't, that's frustrating because you're like, I should be able to have this thing do the thing. And it's not that you're ever wrong. It's just that you have to take a little bit more time to figure out which step that you missed in the process because it's somewhere. 
And when you do it once, you can do it again. And once you've done it a dozen times, suddenly they're calling you a senior developer. And that's just how it goes. It just takes time and persistence and eventually you'll overcome everything. Love that. That is a great way to end. Thanks so much, Roger, for being here with us. Thanks, Thanks for Roger. having me. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Virtual Coffee Podcast. This episode was produced by Dan Ott and Becca hara Weigel. If you have questions or comments, you can hit us up on Twitter at virtualcoffee.io or email us at podcast at virtualcoffee.io. You can find the show notes, sign up for the newsletter, check out any of our other resources on our website, virtualcoffee.io. If you're interested in sponsoring Virtual Coffee, you can find out more information on our website at virtualcoffee.io slash sponsorship. Please subscribe to our podcast and be sure to leave us a review. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.